you giving, that's how we live it Don't be mad at the system, it's simply how we've existed I hear a lot of people talking like they politicians And choose to be an accountant because it's safe in the business Not because they wanna do it, just because they heard it pays And who the fuck wants to be poor, no one, that's how we've been raised Society is getting heavy, I can feel the weight The pressure of success is like a hundred million pounds of shit how you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Hey guys, we're going to have a very interesting topic today. We're going to talk about controlling our gangs and our prisons and jails. More specifically today, we're going to focus on housing. And then me and Russ may even make this into a series. I think another topic we want to touch with gangs is intimidation. How they try to use fear to motivate staff to do foolish things. Now guys, this is going to be a very interesting topic, controlling gangs. And who am I going to have on? Russ Hamilton. Russ, what's up, brother? How you doing? Hey, Anthony, how's it going? Uh, glad to be here. Just uh, got off doing some uh, workout and uh, ready to go here. Hey, Russ, man, Keepers of Chaos, let's get some updates on that Facebook group. Yeah, we're coming up to the 5,000 mark, um, getting lots of uh, good imp input, lots of good engagement and stuff there. I'm looking to grow it every bit I can. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, over these slow winter months that, uh, you know, that we'll maybe even make 6,000. I'm hoping to see, you know, how that goes. Um, going to try and do some things. Of course, this uh, summer, unfortunately, COVID has kind of, you know, taken uh, the wind out of my sails on a couple things I was hoping to do. But I'm going to find some other ways to get the word out there and to get more people involved in Keepers of Chaos. Yes, and I'm going to tell you something, Russ. I, I love the community that you, you, that you have. Uh, the community is very interactive. I see a lot of new boots asking questions. I see a lot of senior staff answering those questions. Hey, before we go to a commercial break, actually, I saw something in the group that I didn't notice before. You have a mentorship there. Can you explain that? Um, yeah, we have a, a mentorship program inside the uh, bounds of uh, Facebook there. Um, so anyone that, uh, you know, uh, wants to mentor or be mentored, um, is welcome to come there and, you know, find someone that, um, that fits with, uh, whatever it is that they're trying to build on. Um, we, of course, we tend to really kind of, uh, cater toward, uh, the younger, newer officers. And, uh, we just want to be able to, you know, help people grow. This is a profession that, um, well, if you saw, you know, some of the uh, videos that we've talked about and done lately, um, you and I especially, we talked about, you know, how there's a negativity in corrections and how some people really don't want to help those people grow. Well, I want to help those people grow. That's why I exist. So, uh, you know, Keepers of Chaos, I think it's a great thing for people to get involved in. Um, find someone that wants to spend some time with you, give you a few points, uh, you know, a few points, a few tips and, you know, help you grow and help you uh, develop into the officer that you want to be. And Russ, real quick, before you go to a sponsor, how does one get to become a mentor? What is it that you look for uh, before they're allowed to be considered a mentor for others? Because I do see like these little profiles as you go down to Facebook, there's profiles of people like I got 17 years and I got five years in. What is it that you look for if somebody wants to become a mentor for the Keepers of Chaos page? Um, the first thing that we look for is enthusiasm, right? We want people that are, you know, pro corrections, uh, not the people that are telling you, you know what, quit. We don't want those in there. We want some people with a level of experience and we want some people that are uh, willing to, you know, be involved, be engaged and willing to, you know, be able to articulate, um, you know, what it is um, that they're able to offer in those regards. And I did see a lot of people on that page. I thought that was awesome. I never noticed that before, but um, I thought that was just what a great thing. I don't know if, they, if there's any other group that's doing that. Uh, so I thought that was pretty cool. So again, if you guys are looking to join a Facebook group, there it is, because not only do you get to kind of participate in the community, but there's a good chance you can have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with a senior correctional officer, which is a lot rare than people think. It's not as, uh, I mean, we're kind of in the shadows, even in the public. A lot of people don't know what we do. We don't advertise it. Um, well, you know, one thing, um, one thing that I like to keep in mind about, you know, being in corrections and uh, trying to be in that position of being a senior officer or, uh, or whether you want to call it a journeyman correctional officer is until you've gained all of that knowledge and experience and then taken it and passed it on to someone else, you're not a master of the craft yet. You have to be able to take what you've learned and pass it on. 
Yes, and that's and I'll be honest, that's another good thing about this platform, your page, uh, is because if you have a lot of senior people that are leaving this profession with all this good knowledge, we give them a chance to come back and share that knowledge instead of that knowledge getting lost and, and gone forever. And I think that also motivates the older staff member because it's still in them. Even when they retire, there's still a little something left that they want to give back. It's just who we are. Now, guys, if you have it, the show Tear Talks through you, brave men and women that work in corrections, so please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. The bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. We're going to go to our sponsor. When we come back, we're going to talk about controlling gang members. Stand by. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University. Learn from the leader. Guys, inmate manipulation is a course that is highly needed. It's the process that's so slow moving and subtle that you don't realize it's happening. When inmates choose to manipulate, they manipulate our need to react. Situational awareness and insight is going to save your career. It's going to save you from doing foolish things. Listen to your gut. So the more insight we have, the more we can recognize what isn't so overt and we can correct our behavior before we fall into a trap that we can't get out of. If you allow an inmate to pull you out of your prescribed role, you are opening up a door for a host of problems. Inmate manipulation, the psychology behind inmate manipulation. Available now. Link in description. All right, Russ, then we're back. So first off, let me just get this controversial question out of the way. Should frontline officers be able to reassign the inmates in their housing dorm or units or pods, whatever the case may be? I know sometimes it's a conflict because they only want to come from supervisors or in some case administration. But what's your thoughts on the officers on the front line just rearranging the housing uh, as they see fit? Um, you know, that's kind of, uh, for me at least, um, when I was an officer, I did that. Um, as a sergeant, I was kind of loath to let that occur because what I found happened lots of times is officers end up getting played. They end up getting worn down. They end up thinking that, oh, you know what? We just, we just need to make things get along to go along. And instead, what they would do is, is they would, inadvertently create problems by, you know, stacking uh, members of the wrong groups up in certain areas. And that allows them to, you know, um, coalesce their power and puts them in a position where they can, you know, maybe be tactically at an advantage to some of their enemies. Um, we don't want that in corrections. We want uh, these uh, STG groups to always have to work under the assumption that they're not going to be able to get the upper hand and always put them in a position where they're having to wonder and worry about what's coming next. You let them get that solid footing. You let them, uh, you know, get comfortable. And that's when you really start having problems with them. Right. And I think there should be some partnership between the officers that work the floor, the supervisors, the classification department. I think that the classification department are those higher ends that are making those decisions to put the inmates where they need to be in the housing location. They, they need to be familiar with not only what those units look like, but how does it feel to walk in that unit? I mean, that's the key. I mean, you know, are we, are we putting these inmates in such a manner where when the officer, you know, takes a walk down that unit, their life, you know, they feel threatened. I mean, because the problem here is even with, with gangs is that the officer is always going to be outnumbered because you, you can't technically, I mean, you don't want to house rival members in the same gang unit. Uh, in the same unit, because obviously there could be war, there could be something going on. So most likely what happens here is that we wind up, you know, putting inmates of the same gang in those same areas only because we know that hopefully there's not going to be any beef that the officers have to respond to. Uh, but with that said, the poor officer there is going to be severely outnumbered. And then when you work in these dorm settings, now you have no obstacles to really stop these inmates from furthering or enhancing 
uh, that connection, that bond. So one of the concerns I've always had as a floor officer is I know we can't put the rival gangs together, uh, obviously because they, you know, they can have conflict and war, but then I'm going to be overpowered with the inmates who do tend to kind of roll together. And now here I am by myself trying to control one whole group. Um, what's your thoughts on that, Russ? I mean, is that like the catch 22 of our job? Well, yeah, there's, there are always those things. It's, it's more difficult in the, um, in the dorm setting, obviously, you know, you have to, uh, generally there, especially if you have dorms that aren't, uh, you know, supervised a hundred percent of the time. Um, sometimes, you know, you just have to, you know, kind of cut bait and, uh, you know, keep, uh, you know, uh, rival factions from being in there inside the housing units, it tends to be a little bit, uh, different story, you know, um, because you do have the cell separations. And so you're able to, you know, keep those individuals, um, you know, house, you know, next to each other, whether they like it or not. That's my preference. I, I wasn't, um, I wasn't at San Quentin when they had the, the segregated tiers, but they used to, you know, have them segregated, you know, Crips, Bloods, North, South, um, whites, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, the stories that I heard from back in those days that, you know, it was just terrible because if you were in trouble with one of them, you were in trouble with all of them. They finally ended up, um, you know, desegregating them and, uh, you know, housing um, all different ones along those tiers. And it really made a difference in the in the safety for the officers. It wasn't easy to do in the beginning, but um, but at the end, you know, it was it was a much better position for the officers to be in because you simply uh, didn't have to worry about every single cell as you came by with, you know, uh, just a, basically a monolith of one particular STG inhabiting that whole tier. So I think what you have to look at is, is you have to be able to place these individuals in as close proximity as you can manage and uh, count on that to help keep them, you know, on their toes against each other and not with staff. Right. And I like what you mentioned before, because a lot of what protects us is how the facility is laid out, you know, so in the dorm setting, I, it really wouldn't be ideal for rival inmates to house together, which I'm sure could happen, obviously, with very limited space, but it wouldn't be ideal because obviously these inmates could probably go back and forth and we're probably going to get hurt just responding to it or become a target if we stop them from doing what they got to do. Uh, but I do like when you mentioned that, but you do have those cells, which at that point, if you have rival gangs, the cells, the layout, the control, the security of the cells can help us control that, that beef to where we have to, you know, we have to be particular as to who we let out and when we let them out. But that's a lot of knowledge that has to go for that officer. That officer is really going to need to know that unit. Correct. Oh yeah. You have, you have to have good staff in there that are on their game and, you know, able to recognize, you know, what that game is and to just, you know, try and make sure, especially, you know, from the classification level down, especially as to, you know, who you're putting in there and how you're going to monitor that whole situation. Yeah. And I would like to think that you, do, you should have a partnership with the custody, with the internal affairs division, whatever you got to do to make sure that, you know, we're up to date with the knowledge, with the gangs to make sure that we know you know, maybe something happened in the streets that could affect what's going on in the prison, you know, and how we house individuals. All of a sudden, inmates that got along that weren't an issue can wind up being an issue. I mean, you could even have, you know, members of the same, um, you know, alliance. So you could have bloods that have different sets and those two different sets are at war. So all because they're bloods doesn't mean they're going to get along. All because they're crips doesn't mean to get along. I mean, I mean, what, what we have gangster sets, warring with rolling sets, you know, neighborhood sets. So, I mean, you know, the, the key is all because you, you, you focus on the alliance, it doesn't mean that they're all going to get along. You really have to have people that are knowledgeable about the sets. The sets is where the dynamics are. Like all because we're bloods doesn't mean I get along with the next blood. We could be in rival sets. You know, my, my could be a West Coast thing. You could be a New York thing, you know, and then the same thing with the Crips. I mean, Crips just in California alone, gangster sets, rolling sets. I mean, the list goes on and all because they're Crips don't mean they get along, you know, um, but having said that, officers that have knowledge about that culture, but also kind of are up to date with what's going on on the outside, because I I've seen where obviously stuff happens on the outside that immediately affects the inside. And the officers that are working the prisons are on top of that. Hey, we just had this beef on the streets. 
Uh, I had one of my sources just tell me that, you know, that's going to uh, affect us here with this, this, and this. And next thing you know, we're creating moves to alleviate that beef, which means even maybe shipping a whole set out of the facility and spread them out to eliminate their power amongst the uh, one facility. So that's another thing, Russ. Would you agree that sometimes when you feel that if there is a gang that has a very powerful presence, let's say in your prison, you know, and how many prisons, let's say, are in California, maybe it's about time we start splitting them up and shipping them out. Yeah, that, that's one of the reasons why hopefully, um, hopefully at that departmental level, you know, people are on top of that and they realize the value of just, you know, having some churn within the ranks. Um, it, you know, as inmates tend to get to one place and they tend to either try and stay there or get away from it, naturally you start to end up with these, you know, factious little blobs that, um, that end up putting you in a position to have to deal with it after something does happen in the street. If you try and deal with it ahead of time and make sure that you're not allowing uh, these things to develop, then, uh, you know, maybe that's something that you won't have to do at that moment in time. But if you just start having, you know, one group that specifically is being attracted to this one prison, trying to get there and stay there and consolidate, it's just going to be, you know, the same old, uh, you know, heartaches and headaches over and over again. But human nature being what it is, sometimes we end up getting, uh, you know, manipulated into that. Or we try and think of it as, well, it's not so bad because nothing's going on right now. Um, it's been working so far, uh, but we really need to stay you know, ahead of that game and to try and keep it from becoming that future headache. I know some people may think, Russ, that if you move the leaders around, sometimes they can gain an influence in other areas. And maybe so, but if you keep them moving, and you don't give them a chance to solidify their, you know, their foundation. One thing is, is that, you know, if they can't solidify their foundation, they really don't get a chance to make any place home. But it also advertises the authority of the house. You know what I mean? Like you get an inmate that, you know, may feel that he's running stuff, you know, and you look at, wow, this guy's very comfortable. Looks like he thinks he's running the housing unit. Then what we have to do is we have to show him who really runs. It. And sometimes that's just a matter of, you know what? This guy's way too comfortable. He's too comfortable also with staff. It's time we ship him out. And that advertises the authority and puts that gang member where they need to be, which is basically it's still our house and not yours. I mean, I mean, again, what's, what's your thoughts on advertising that level of authority? Yeah, I think that's something that's absolutely necessary. Um, we've had cases, you know, here in California, even recently, like down, at, uh, down in uh, San Diego, where um, pretty much uh, they've let up on these individuals and these gangs too much. And they become the ones that are the power brokers that are running the house. And that has to be taken back away from them somehow, some way, at some point. Um, it, happened, uh, it happened in the, uh, the mid-90s and again in the early 2000s at several uh, different joints in California where um, the STG strongholds were just, you know, too big and they would send down, uh, you know, people to take it back over, to remanage it, to start with the cell extractions, to start with the mass searches and uh, to be able to, you know, bring the house back into order. You never want to let things get so far out of kilter though, that you have to do that. And that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why, you know, that you really do need that high level professional management to be able to recognize those things and not be so afraid of not just the inmates, but the um, influence that the inmates have over our politicians and everything else. And uh, what I've seen in, in California, especially recently, is uh, there tends to be, you know, a fear um, amongst people, uh, administrators all the way down the line of the influence that these inmates do wield amongst the politicians and how they get catered to more and more. And uh, now we've seen, of course, you know, the, the numbers and the population in California has dropped. They've got this great excuse of COVID to let everyone go from, from cop killers to, you know, heads of gangs. So, you know, I'm, I'm waiting to see what that shift in balance, how that pendulum is going to swing back. Because at some point it will have to, 
or we're going to be put in a position where we're going to end up maybe losing some prisons, having some, you know, major Attica type events. Uh, it's hard to say what could be out there on the horizon. I'm hoping that they'll try and put themselves in a position, though, where they'll be able to, you know, negate the influence of those gangs. Because to me, looking from the outside now, after being retired for a little bit, it looks pretty scary. Yeah, you know what? They start to feel that they're untouchable, and then we don't start, and then this staff, we stop trusting the system. So now you have a system that's really an eye for an eye, and that's not what we want. You know, it's not what we want. We want a system that we could trust, so we know that if something happens to us, we can trust the lawmakers into doing the right thing. That motivates us to do the job, but when you feel that everything's going towards the MA population, including the gangs, uh, there's really nothing to stop them from doing anything foolish. So now you're putting it in our hands, you know, and we have to at our survival, you know, not that we want to do it because we know it's not right. Uh, but sometimes we will, because we feel if we don't, we're going to get walked on, you know, Russ, you mentioned a couple of things too, about control of the house, uh, which is very important to me uh, just before with the searches and whatnot. You know, one thing is, is that when you deal with these gangs, especially to me, when they're in these dorm settings, you know, and they're with their people, they're going to flaunt a little bit, you know, and, and they're going to try to kind of maneuver how they want to maneuver. And sometimes, and it makes sense because we're human. This is going to be a little bit different than the police, actually, is that we're going to directly go right into their house. Because, you know, again, we're, we're not, this is, this is not like, you know, where uh, maybe a street cop that, you know, is walking by and then everybody scatters. You know, this is a dorm setting. We're going to have that forced interaction with these gang members. But during that time, even if that gang member has 20 or 30 people behind them, that one officer that's probably walking the floor, sad to say, because there should be more, but the one officer that's work, walking that floor has to advertise a level of authority um, that can't be intimidated by that one leader and the 30 other followers that are willing to follow him. And sometimes how they establish that authority, and, and I, I like to think that you would agree, is first off being on top, don't let me, you know, not let me make maneuver, no matter how small things are, you know, um, being on, on top of those searches, doing what you got to do. But more importantly, having the support of the supervisors, if they have to make a move and they can justify that move. These are all things of, that show authority that I feel that should be supported. So it reminds the gang members, OK, you're here, but at the end of the day, you ain't running shit. I mean, would you agree? Yeah, that's one thing that you always want to keep on top of is, uh, you know, whenever you're doing something in that, uh, especially, like you say, in those dorms and stuff, is you want to be able to show these guys, hey, stuff starts to go bad. We've got instant, instant response down there. You know, we've got uh, people coming up on the gum walks, hopefully. Uh, you know, we've got, you know, people flooding the line through the doors. And hopefully, you know, we're bringing some munitions to that, you know, not just our bodies. Uh, it kills me seeing uh, some of these uh, departments across the country who can flood that line with bodies, but they don't have any equipment. You know, you want to try and take into account the fact you want everybody to be that force multiplier, uh, to be well equipped, to be over equipped, if there could be such a thing. And, to, you know, make it very, very expensive and very, very um, not worth their while for these inmates to try and flex and to try and, you know, keep uh, that uh, level of power. You want to, you know, be able to put them in a position where what they're doing is not going to help their supposed or alleged cause, so to speak. Also, I will tell you one thing, if you have a good officer and they're on point with their job, uh, you know, and let's say they're close to finding things, because obviously these gang members, they'd be running stuff in those prisons, you know, dr uh, drugs, whatever it is to make their money. And then when officers start getting close to finding stuff that can mess with that money, you know, that that prisoner jail economy, they're going to do what they can to try to get that officer out of the unit. You know, whether it's uh, anonymous threats or whether they try to threaten the officer, um, you know, when they're dealing with that officer. Either way, each threat should be taken seriously. Uh, but I don't think and obviously you're going to agree um, that even though it's a very scary situation, because it is these inmates, you know, these gang members can get in your face and make threats that could be very valid. That won't just be inside the prison, but be outside the prison walls. Um, you know, obviously when they investigate the threat, they're going to have to see, okay, well, first off, is the threat valid? You know, listen to those phone calls. I hope those internal affairs divisions, they access everything. 
uh, you know, check mail, check whatever it is to see how valid the threat is. But they also need to talk to the officer to ask the officer, are you willing to go back or do you feel that there is a safety concern? Because this happens to all the best officers around point getting ready to find stuff that these inmates are going to do what they can to intimidate. But I will ask the officers if they can, because it is a scary situation, that you go right back onto that post and don't let them see that you're afraid. So the moment they know that the threat is not valid or whatever it is and you're clear to go, you know, go back to that post and advertise that authority. I'm not, I'm not talking about mismanager authority, but don't let them think that, oh, because I've been able to threaten you and get that threat off, that I'm going to go, you know, that you're going to go ahead and be afraid to do your job. You know, at that point, you, you, you still do your job, still stay motivated. And if you're on track of finding something, you find it. You know, Russ, I mean, you've been threatened before, Russ. And you know that threat really is, I'm not saying it can't be real, because it always could be real. Don't get me wrong. But you know, the people that get threatened are the people that are close to finding something big. Yeah, the, the ones that are, you know, the perennial thorn in their side. And, you know, I've had those things happen before. Um, but that's the point at which we have to make it, you know, so costly for them to, to do that, to make that sort of threat. You know, the instant that happens, you know, we should be like, OK, we know who made the threat. Maybe we don't know who made the threat, but we have an idea. And, uh, you know, let's roll those shot collars up. Let's take our time. Let's do a real thorough investigation that maybe takes, you know, 80, 90, 120 days while they're sitting there having to chill in SAG. Um, you know, let's let's take it as far as we possibly can and let's uh, let's put that hit in their movement, in uh, their ability to call shots, uh, in their ability to move that contraband. Let's bring in the search teams. Let's make let's make doing those things to those officers as expensive as we possibly can. And also, guys, if you're running a housing unit, I would also recommend that if you have to have interactions with these inmates, you try to do it one on one because they're going to act a little bit differently by themselves than they will with their peers. I would always say that if you can do it one on one or two on one, but on your end, you know what I mean? The point is, is that you don't want to have any dialogue when they're in front of their peers, because that's when they're going to showboat. That's when they're going to do what they got to do to make themselves look good in front of their peers. But most of the time, and I think Russ would agree, is that when you take that inmate out of that surrounding and you go to have that one-on-one -on -one dialogue, you know, the inmate's going to be totally different and you'll be able to address the concern. And plus, especially when it comes to gangs, it, you have to be very particular in the timing. This is not about reaction right now. This is about being strategic in how you have to do your job, how you have to, you know get your level of authority across. If you sit there and you're going to quickly, let's say they do something, you quickly jump and react and you're in the middle of a dorm surrounded by the enemy, it's not time. You know, sometimes I know Russ, Russ you know, if we're on the same page here, is sometimes you'll be walk, walking that dorm and let's say you see something out of the corner of your eye that looks like a possible cell phone or some drugs being passed. You as that single officer is not going to want to go into that group and seize those drugs or grab those cell phones. Don't get me wrong, it's a great find. You know, but the find is not worth your life at that point. You know, pretend you ignore it, you know, that you didn't see it and then be strategic, call your people. And then when you have enough there ready, you go after it. But you'd be a fool if, you know, and I'm sure people have done it where you got about a, a gang, maybe 20, 30 deep and you see a cell phone in the corner of your eye and you're by yourself and you're going to run in and go grab that cell phone. Because at the end of the day, those inmates, they're not going to give you that cell phone willingly because they have to fight. They cannot just allow you to have that phone. Um, what's your thoughts? I'm sure you've seen that, right? You sure you've seen people in that dorm chasing after that phone without backup. Um, yeah, you know, for the most part, though, I would say that um, I try and uh, train my people, uh, you know, the best I can to try and do everything they can to get that uh, to get that movement frozen, uh, to try and get somebody to respond to respond in there. Uh, try and flood that line with as many bodies as we can, um, you know, and and handle it that way if that's what the appropriate way is. Sometimes you have to back off from the play, you know, because it's just it's just too dangerous. I've been there. I've been there myself. You know, I had um, some guys in a. I'll, I'll never forget this man. I had some guys in a bathroom, and I knew something was really really wrong, and uh, I had to step out call for assistance and go back in there 
and ended up with, you know, about a 10 and a half inch uh, iron shank. And I knew that, um, you know, if I'd pressed the issue right then, that that would have been used on me. But I just didn't know exactly what it was right at that moment. Uh, but at the same time, you know, um, the odds are a little more in my favor, maybe only two or three guys there and help, uh, you know, 15, 20 seconds away. People can see me. I've made those plays before and fortunately, you know, come out good. Um, I had one that I was probably a little foolish on one time where I recovered uh, seven shanks from about 10 inmates. And I think just because I surprised him. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I had uh, fortunately I had uh, lethal force overhead. Uh, that's probably why it went as well as it did. But, uh, you know, you just have to try and make the smart plays. But at the same time, you have to carry a level of aggression about you. If you don't have, um, you know, that uh, aggressive mindset, uh, you're never going to be able to make those kind of interdictions. And it's hard to tell a person when they should back off and when they should go forward. Um, you know, I've always had to watch myself because I always tended to want to charge instead. Um, but, you know, I learned, especially in my later years, to try and hold off, to back off, to try and size things up and to try and bring things where they were more in my favor. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I didn't end up fighting for a lot of contraband. Well, you know what it is, Russ? It's strategic. I mean, if we... If we did a show right now and we said, hey, if you guys see contraband, you know, especially in a dorm when you're severely outnumbered, go charge after it. Uh, the advice would be very uh, careless. And, uh, you know, what you need to do is you need to be strategic. You know, when you see that contraband, you know, it's there, you know, it's somewhere, you know, but be strategic in your response. You know, don't don't sit there and go gung ho, you know, sit there, formulate a plan like you mentioned. Uh, definitely get back up and also let your supervisors know, because you know, what's sad too, is that a lot of these places, they're so understaffed that, you know, someone should know you're going in for something because if not, you're going to get assaulted. And I don't know if you're going to have a response team. You know, I, I've known where this may sound crazy, but I've known shifts that are, their numbers aren't as strong. Like let's say an overnight shift, you know, and let's say you're sitting there working overnight and, you know, you as an officer, you know, you see this, these inmates, they could be on a cell phone. You see it. They could be on a cell phone. But the night crew is a skeleton crew. You're lucky to have a, another officer to respond if there's a concern. So you have to ask yourself, even as a supervisor, should I jump in and grab that phone now and risk, you know, the integrity of the facility? Because I don't have a response team. Let's say they're out on trips. I don't know where my facility itself is just a skeleton crew. Or could this hold on till morning? You know, it's, it's here. We know it's here. It can't go nowhere. Should we wait till morning? And the first thing in the morning when manpower's in, you redirect them to that dorm and you rip it up. I mean, what would be your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, it, it depends on a lot of different factors. And I think um, the, the one factor I never want to see it rely on, though, is just that whole idea of, laziness well it's just a cell phone you know it's just some dope it's you know just i, I mean i actually i actually had uh, a, a peace a correctional peace officer counselor one time try and tell me that an inmate in possession of a shank is not an emergency and you know i just sometimes i struggle with some people who, for whatever reason, don't, you know, share my particular philosophy on things. To me, that's always an emergency. To me, that's, you know, 100% go and track that individual down, uh, take them at gunpoint if, you, if necessary, and um, or some other uh, form of munitions. I've been lucky in several places that I've worked. We had, you know, we have lethal coverage overhead. Uh, but whether you're going in there with direct impact rounds, whatever, you know what, it's time to act. It's time to, you know, uh, make a decision. You're getting paid to uh, take risks. And yet at the same time, you have to mitigate those risks. So it's, it's not easy. But that's where, you know, critical thinking is uh, so monumentally important to be able to have the right outcome. Uh, the right outcome, of course, is always for us to recover what that item is and to go home safe at the end of that night at the same time. The two are paired. 
Yeah, well said. And definitely when you're responding to that and when you're trying to grab that contraband or seize it, you definitely want to have the support because, you know, at any moment, you know, your effort to seize that contraband can go bad. I mean, these inmates aren't just going to give it up. Um, you know, you, you're, there's going to be a bit of a struggle, a bit of a back and forth. And you want to make sure that if that happens, you have the backing there or else, you know, you yourself could be putting yourself into a situation where, you know, it could be a possible hostage situation just to grab the contraband. You know, if you're running into these dorms and just so motivated to grab the contraband that you're not thinking about, you know, what else could happen to you. I mean, I've seen people, you know, chase after the phone, chase after the glory of the contraband, not realizing that it wasn't well thought out. Like you just ran into a dorm right now to grab that phone. You left your one gate open or whatever it is. So now you just compromised another area. Well, I wanted to get the phone. Yeah, but you have to be strategic. You know, sometimes you have to walk by, pretend that you didn't see it, and then come back full force and aggressive. You know what I mean? You know, but but if you sit there and, you know, you're just so motivated to get the contraband, you wind up putting the facility at risk because you're not focused on anything else but grabbing that phone. And then when you go to grab it, you're going to realize you're in a whole world of shit because the inmates are going to surround you. And now, oh, yeah, you got a cell phone. But at the end of the day, you're going to get a beating for it. So um, and I think management would also agree, like, you know, God forbid, you know, let's say there was a weapon in the unit because you mentioned a shank, right? In order for you to go after that shank, especially in the dorm room, and we're focused on dorms here. That would be the real big concern. I would like to think we have enough manpower to kind of go into these cells. I mean, what do you have, one or two inmates? Um, but when it comes to the dorm, a little bit more complicated, you know, especially when the dorms are going to have, there's no obstacle to stop the inmates from united. So if you have gang members that are there that are already united, the dorm furthers that unity, you know? So, you know, at any time they could pounce. But like, if you feel that, you know, there's, you know, if management sees that, okay, this officer knows that there was a weapon, can you explain why you didn't go for it? Well, because it was an overnight shift. I didn't have enough backup. And at that time, I thought me going for the weapon would pose a greater risk to the facility. You know, and that, that has to be taken into account. The, the, the lives of one versus the lives of many. You know, if I went in to, to grab that knife or grab that shank and my only backup at the time is a, a sergeant right now because, you know, we don't have enough manpower here. I just think it's too much of a risk, but I took note that there was contraband. And then at that point we decided to wait until uh, we had enough manpower available just to kind of balance, you know, what we need just in case it turns out to be an ugly situation. And I know Russ, I'm sure you, you've dealt that even when you were, uh, you know, a, a supervisor, have you ever, you know, that's a question. Have you ever got mad at somebody for, going after contraband. But with that said, in the process that I'm trying to go out the contraband, maybe they could have put the facility at risk a bit. Yeah. You know, what I always like to see is what I, is what I like to call tactical intelligence, you know, that ability to, to see what the problem is and to come up with a solution. Um, you know, sometimes the right solution is, is to is to deploy force right then and there you know if i had an inmate that close to me i had i had an inmate charge me one time with a uh pulling a weapon out of his out of his uh you know waistband and uh fortunately i didn't have to hit him in the head you know but that's what i was going to do i was going to take my baton and i was going to i was going to use lethal force on this guy because i thought it was that bad of a situation turned out that he decided to lay down and stick the the shank in in the earth instead uh, but it's the same thing, though, if, when you're going up against multiple inmates. I mean, get the get the tactics working in your favor. You know, um, can we is there a way we can cordon off that area? Is there a way we can uh, maybe sound the alarm and get the rest of the inmates in the general area um, uh, seated down or into a prone position? Can I bring some officers in there? Maybe I bring some uh, 40 millimeter uh, munitions in there so we can uh, start shooting inmates if they have uh, weapons with some less lethal munitions. Uh, maybe we need to uh, toss some chemical agents in there, whatever it takes. I'm all about doing whatever it takes, but we got to do it at that smarter um, tactical intelligence level and not just let our emotions run wild where we're so you know enthused about going after um, some some crime, some contraband, that we put ourselves in a position where we're going to get hurt. 
And so, you know, you just have to be able to make that call on the spot and figure out what the best solution is. Start working that solution and get it to a point where you have the clear and present advantage. Now, I know we were talking about housing, but I think this does fall into housing, right? Would you agree? Because we kind of went into searches and stuff. I, yeah, I, I, to me, it's all part and parcel the same. I don't, I don't know how you can, you know, chop things up and just, you know, say one thing is one thing and another because it all leads to different areas, you know, because you can end up, because you can talk about contraband moving from a housing unit to the kitchen or from the kitchen to the housing unit. And uh, all of these things do involve, especially those STGs, because they're the ones that are, uh, they're the ones that are making the money off of the dope that they're moving, using the shanks uh, to protect the dope, using the shanks to coerce those people that they don't want selling dope from taking over their territory inside the prison. It's all part and parcel of the same thing. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of different angles and you push or pull or take or set one thing off and it affects the rest of the balance of everything around you. Right. And I'll tell you something, at the end of the day, these officers are already outnumbered. So we have to do whatever we can to be strategic in our approach and to be mindful of the dangers that we could put people in if we're not thinking about what we need to do, you know? And again, sometimes that's like you said, Russ, you got to take that breather before you jump. Remember checkers versus chess. Hey, Russ, you have anything you want to say in closing? Uh, yeah. I just want to say I had a great time coming back in again and having this conversation. Uh, hope we have many more like it in the future. Uh, congratulations on your upcoming book. I can't wait to see that in print. Uh, and, uh, then Anthony had to sharpen all of his best crayons to, uh, to get that puppy into print. Yes. I went back to my Crayola 64. <laughs> that, Crayola? And now Russ, you know, let this motivate you. You got a book on complacency in your head and you're being complacent about it. <laughs> I know. I, I know I am Anthony. And it's, it's just, it's just the hardest thing to, to eke out time in my, in my schedule, but I'm going to, I'm going to try and figure out a way to do it. You know what helped me real quick? Microsoft Word on the phone. I dictated a lot, and then my editor's great. It costly, but they transition. They smooth things out, and uh, you'll be shocked from what you gave them to what the finished product is. It's pretty cool. And uh, great. Uh, let me just congratulate you on the success of Keepers of Chaos. Great community mentorship, just really doing a lot for the profession and uh, bringing people together uh, and also giving about a lot of respect because one thing you don't allow in that are people that hate this profession. And I, I think that when you eliminate the haters – all you have is nothing but positivity in that group. So I think that's well done. And uh, shout out to your moderators. Um, all right, guys, the show Tear Talk has come to a close. Hope you guys enjoyed the topic. I don't forget, guys, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. Bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. Stay safe. <laughs>